And I want to uh, just reflect on a thought I had this morning as I read the Psalms. You know, Psalm 53, the psalmist says that there are people who, who think there is no God. And I thought, well, that's very true even today, isn't it? Some say there is no God. And yet the psalmist says, and the Bible says, they're fools. How could you not believe in a God? And as we hear through the stories today, I hope that you get a sense yet yeah, there certainly is a God and he's certainly one we want to get to know. He's a heavenly father and he's there for us. So do listen in. And if we truly seek God, the psalmist says, we're wise. We're wise to seek after him. So let's uh, begin our time together with a, a prayer to our heavenly father and our God in heaven. Oh, Lord God and Father, almighty one, the one who created all that is and all that we see and all that we are. And we worship you this morning. We come wanting to seek after you, to know more of you, to sense you at work in and around us. We pray for a world that largely has turned its back on you. Some of whom say there is no God. And Lord, we want to challenge that thinking. We want to demonstrate we want to be a beacon for Jesus and say yes there is and he loves you and he sent his son to die for you Lord encourage us enrich us in our faith pour out your spirit on us this morning that we may see and know with greater faith and greater understanding who you are and how you want to work in and through us we ask these things in Jesus name amen well, we start off with uh, an interview. Got three friends here, uh, Sydney and Iris and Lionel. But the, the Baptist uh, in this area started way back in 1650. Uh, a group of believers, Baptist believers from uh, Kilmington set out and they planted a meeting house in nearby Luffwood, just over in Dowood. And they began with a meeting house there and they began to grow and flourish saying we want the, the Bible to be our basis of all that we believe and they began to then plant congregations and they planted out in Chard and they planted out in Lyme Regis and they planted all around and then eventually in 1832, 1833 uh, someone built a chapel here in Kilmington and some of those believers came back home as it were to their roots and uh, that was the chapel that w was our last chapel that we are thinking about this morning now these three friends they they remember well that chapel and lots of memories there and um, you, you go back a long way in history not that people didn't drive to church in those days it's just that they waved a red flag when they <laughs> came in, 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 in their car so start off with uh, Lionel and Iris uh, you um, you remember the chapel well. We don't have so many pictures, but I know you have some. But but tell us something about your memories of the chapel there, if you would. Well, the first time I had any um, connection with the old chapel was uh, I was born and living in Honiton, and uh, we heard that there was something going on at Kilmington, and it was a young people's convention. And they had, used to have a rally, and I came up with some other people to one of the rallies. That was the first time that I'd ever been in the chapel. And uh, after that, um, yes, I started courting. <laughs> and uh, I married David's brother, actually, Clifford Pengilly. And uh, I was 19 when I was married. And uh, I became a member of the church probably by the time I was 20. Right, okay. So, so it, it does go back a long way. And your wedding was actually in that old chapel? Uh, no, no. Right. I was, we were married at uh, Western Gospel Hall, a tiny gospel hall at Western, just outside of uh, Homerton. We but, had to walk to chapel then, okay. just ride a bike. <laughs> It was about a mile and a half away from home. Right, okay. And so your, your family were raised uh, in, in the old chapel and grew up there as children. Yes. Excellent. Um, Lionel, do you want to add anything to, to that, your memories of, because I think your family also had connections there. 
Yes, my parents actually moved from Shute to Kilmington in 1920. Um, I wasn't there then. <laughs> but um, I think my father's family had been connected before that, but I'm not too sure about the details there. Um, so I, I grew up in, in the, basically in the church, and, um, you know, we've seen ups and downs since, since then, but the, um, the convention that uh, Iris mentioned, that, that started in the early 50s and went on for 10 years. Uh, and we got, I suppose we got 20 or 30 come from other churches? Possibly. Something like that. And, and they were, the, the membership of the church opened their homes to hospitality and uh, the, the, the people who came, uh, you know, had, had uh, the hospitality and uh, the, the cooking, the meals during the day were all worked out in the old and very tiny kitchen that was there then. Yeah. Um, later years it was enlarged quite considerably. But yes, they were, they were really good times and fostered a lot of friendships. And <coughs> Iris and Clifford weren't the only ones, I think, that uh, uh, the, the friendships started there and developed. Um, but yes, it, it went on, um, as I say, that was in the 50s and the, into the 60s. Um, uh, I, I can remember my mother being baptized there and um, uh, Iris's family, and then later on, Gilletta. And of course, we were, we were married in Kilmington. Yes. We didn't. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was. So lots yeah. of, of it, memories there, families, weddings, special funerals, and, and, yeah. and special occasions. Yeah. Sydney, take up the story. Tell us more of, of what oh. went on in that chapel. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to 1920, and as Lionel says, I wasn't around then, but I remember my father telling me that he was in the gallery at the Kilwin Church when Reverend Bastable was preaching, and his text for the day was, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And he felt that God was speaking to him to be a minister and then to be a missionary. And so he left his job and he went to Bristol Baptist College where Mike is training now, later going to Belgium and doing a medical course. And he ended up in, in Africa, what was known as the Belgium Congo then, and he worked there for 25 years. He met my mother who was um, a missionary with Regions Beyond, which was a Scottish missionary society um, moving on, I came back, I came to England at the age of four, three and a half to four, um, 1940, and my grandmother brought me up and I was uh, taken to the chapel. She took me to the chapel at Kelmington. My first remembrance of the chapel was the text at the front of the chapel, uh, serve the Lord with gladness, and the cross in the middle was entwined with the text, God is love. Moving on a further 10 years, Iris and Lyne have talked about the convention times. Red Spooner and his wife Lucy were, at that time, a minister at the church. And he was a very evangelical man. And in the 50s, he led me to the Lord, and I became a born-again Christian. Um, he came to the church with a vision of the, coven, the convention. He wanted a long weekend in the summer when young people from all the churches around the area would gather in Kilmington and they would have youth speakers. Uh, they were put up in the, the congregation homes to sleep and they came to the church in the day to prepare the meals in the kitchen and in the manse garden and many friendships were forged at that time um, from, I'd say, I can't remember all the places, but it was Hemioc, Honiton, Lymebury, Seaton, Beer, Seaton, and uh, 
Exeter, Exeter as far afield as Exeter and Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met, we had many friendships. In fact, Lionel sort of spoke about this. Uh, the joke in the church was that three girls came from Lyme Regis Church and they married three young men in Kilmington Church. There we go. Good stuff. So it's a place where people came to faith, where faith was built up, not just for the village, but from a very the wide area. You know, all the churches in the area. And that, that's an interesting, you know, uh, picture for us to hold on to, that this chapel and Luffwood were always going on, sowing seed, building up faith, and uh, what, a, what a great heritage to have. So thank you for those memories. Can I we... just say one or two yeah, things? Yeah, okay. Um, further, going on to the, um, the end of the 50s, when I came out of the army, I was made a deacon, and I served with Lionel for 40 years on the diaconate. Um, Aris worked in the Sunday school with Sylvia and other helpers at that time. There was a village youth club in the church, and uh, people in the village came to that. And uh, going on a few more years, when the fire came to the church, I was a um, fabric steward with Cyril Mabley, who many of you know. And five years before that, we had spent a great deal of money on the church. And uh, we had a new roof put on the church building. The inside walls were stripped of plaster and damp proofing putting in. And uh, in the schoolroom, there was a fungus in the floor, dry rot, and the whole floor was replaced in the schoolroom. This mounted to quite a bit of money, over 60 odd thousand pounds. And I didn't see the fire, but the day after, I rang up Cyril and I said, I'm devastated because I don't know the way that God is leading us at this time. And Cyril, in his wisdom, said to me, God's not interested in money as we are interested, only that his will may be done. And uh, following that time, I was on the parish council. Two sites came up in the village, George Lane and uh, this site here. Most of the people in the church preferred the site in George Lane, but the the councillors were unanimous on this site. God's will was done, and we are here today, and we can rejoice in that. And the only words I can say is, to God be the glory. Mm. Not what we've done, but what yeah. God has done. Excellent. Thank you.